All right, um, so today I'm gonna to be taking a look at the uh, final critique hour of the year, which is uh, the elemental design challenge. Basically, you were supposed to pick a texture from the textures that are listed in the Reddit. So to join us, all you have to do is go to astrack.com and click on the Reddit icon in the top right. Please make sure that you join me on Twitch. Click on the Twitch icon to join the streams. Twitch does send out notifications, so it's not terrible. Um, and it will uh, uh, be the same exact link each time, which is different from how it was like with um, YouTube, where it was a different link every time it forced me to create an event. It didn't have a stream live or constant, you know, consistent link. I'm not sure why YouTube did that, which is really stupid. Um, so Twitch actually has a great system and I'm learning it as I go. And if you have missed some live streams or if, you, if you're wondering where all the notifications are, I'm not streaming on YouTube anymore. I am streaming on Twitch. So this coming, coming year, I'm going to do my best to make sure everybody knows that I am on Twitch. Twitch.com, twitch.tv slash Estebrack. So let's look at... Um, the Reddit. So the submission for the Halloween, I mean for the uh, design challenge, let me find it for you, is right here. And I forgot to pin it to the top. So basically it is um, to design your winter familiar uh, and stay in the theme, you know, all Christmassy and stuff and not necessarily Christmassy, but definitely winter seasonal. As with every community challenge, there is a material texture requirement for uh, this challenge. The twist, the familiar must be an elemental familiar. It must be the texture itself. Um, so you can either have ice, rock, or some kind of precious rock, um, twigs, snow, and, or cloud. Uh, twigs or branches made out of snow or cloud. Um, and then the second texture element requirement is that your elemental must have at least one glowing component to it. Um, so maybe a magical thing, at least one uh, glowing component. Um, so you were supposed to take a texture and turn it into um, something made out of that texture. So technically, this one here is not right. Um, just because you made it take the shape of, like it feels like we're just looking at skeleton of a deer. Um, and it's not necessarily a, a, a texture that embodies the thing it's made out of. You kind of just made like a ghoulish character. Um, so what does it mean by elemental? The example, like this is a perfect example because it's made out of it. It's not necessarily any recognizable thing, though it can be a bird. It kind of has wings, but it's made out of the subject itself. Um, another one would be this one here. Um, it's kind of like it's camouflaged and it's so freaking cute because it's like a capybara snow elemental. This is the, probably the best one of the of the lot, just because you really did um, embody that the 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 element. Um, it's made out of snow, which is so cute. Because how would you even find it if you were looking for it? And um, this one is good. Uh, it's made out of the snow. It's like ice. It's an ice uh, uh, titan or something. Um, but it's very dark. So I'm going to be taking a look at how to kind of bring that one out. This one is super cute, also made out of it, um, and that's that's also kind of what I was going for. But then you added an extra element to it, which was the fact that it's like a, it's like carrying or hauling something, um, or that it's just in that shape. But either way, you did a really good job, and you actually showed us it's made out of the material. And I love the way you did each rock. I think you did wonderfully, um, especially here. You grabbed the blue of the of this material, I don't know what it is, um, and, and you used it on the crystals. Beautiful job. Um, so uh, let's talk about how to improve some of these. So I'll start, so, th so both of these are super cute. You change the light source later on, so this is why I grabbed an older one. I feel like this light source is cuter just because it's actually um, a lot more springy, but also very wintry. Uh, but it's okay. You can you could uh, because maybe you wanted to add that glowing element. You wanted to darken it. Um, so let's talk about that. So you used a some moonlight, uh, yellow moonlight. But you used none of that moonlight 
in the actual, one moment, please. Oh dear. Um, in the, uh, on the snow, sorry, one second. And then you added a spider. So the spider, and then you added a glowing horn. So like the spider is a little bit distracting. I'm not sure who told you to add the spider or why you wanted it. But this is about the elemental, not so much about the elemental plus friend. Um, so let's just try to push this as far as possible here. But beautiful little pieces. I think it was um, a nice little break from all of the other serious stuff we usually do in these uh, assignments, which is character design and all of that. This was just mo mostly a very fun texture study. So the thing with texture studies, the reason why they're so important is because unless you are directly ordered to draw that texture or study that texture, there's really not, there's really no artist that independently goes out and seeks to study this much variety of texture. So texture language, understanding what textures need in order to be visible as those textures, it, it, it needs a lot of experience and a lot of mileage studying each particular uh, texture. There's no one texture you can study that helps you learn them all. Um, there's form studies which helps you understand volume, meaning a rock that actually looks thick like a rock, or snow that actually looks like it's a bulk of snow. Um, but uh, but, but the, you know, that doesn't really solve the question, what do I do with my brush when I want to represent a pile of leaves versus the, the bark of a tree um, or the surface of snow. And unless you're actually asked to go and study these things, you won't do it on your own independently. Some, some artists are pretty proactive um, and, and they do try to jump in and do texture studies, but this is why challenges are so important because they, you do, you, you're doing something that you would otherwise have taken maybe, you know, um, like next year or delayed it to next year to do it. Um, and uh, it's always good to challenge yourself and move, move away from that comfortable learning style of self-taught. Self-taught is great until you start getting a little lazy. So what I'm going to do is bring in some subsurface scattering. Basically subsurface is only where there are shadows. That's the only place we see it. So I'm going to apply a bunch of brightness to these shadows and then I'm going to go backward. And then I'm going to delete really only where I have the biggest shadow. So in place of the deepest, darkest part of the core shadow, we've actually put a glowing element. That's all subsurface is. And then there's the saturation line, especially if this is snow. So saturation gets really boosted up if it's ice or snow. So I'm just boosting that saturation right up. It's already pretty saturated. And then I'm also going to boost the saturation on the outer rim of each shadow, which you've done a lot, but I'm just going to push it a little bit further. <clears throat> so any questions about texture? What are some of the biggest issues you guys have when it comes to texture? Growing up, the hardest texture for me to do was rock because it was so opposite to skin, which I was always painting, and because I was always studying the face, I found that it was impossible. And there was a time when I was obsessed with doing matte painting, so I eventually uh, stopped painting portraits and just started doing landscapes and it came down to rocks. I just could not figure them out. So I'm just adding a bit of subsurface here. Rocks were the most difficult thing, and it was as soon as I started understanding what the rock was that I started understanding the cube. So I'm just kind of tapering the horn a little bit. And um, each of these icicles here could be casting a shadow off the twig. So what I'm gonna do is grab the shadow here, go on the dark end, and just the twig itself is casting the shadow on the icicle. And then the icicle being the texture, um, you know, understanding what translucency is, because I've studied ice, I know that visually, instinctively, I have this feeling that I should raise their brightness all the way up. So that instinct, you don't really pick it up unless you do these texture studies. It's a very different type of art. Texture studies is not 
art anymore. It's more science. It's like saying, um, uh, uh, it's hard to find an equivalent in another field of study. Um, it's like saying, instead of reading, I'm just gonna, you know, I'm studying literature. Instead of reading, I'm just going to hear about, or, or, or yeah, I'm gonna hear about the story, but I'm not gonna read it. That's the same thing as I'm only going to see what I could pull off with this texture and you know when I need it in an illustration, but I won't actually go and study it. That's insane. Like, what are you gonna learn? If you're not doing, if you're studying English Lit, which I studied in uni, um, and I didn't read a single book, I would not have graduated. So, uh, or understood a single thing about my degree. So when you think about this stuff, um, and you start realizing, yeah, I have actually tried to supplement my knowledge of textures with a bunch of other shortcuts that aren't really textures. And this entire time I've wondered why my work doesn't look finished, why I don't know how to, how to illustrate this type of object, why my illustrations all feel very flat, why I draw a portrait and suddenly I just want to stop drawing altogether because once I'm done the portrait, I'm done with everything else. So when you think about this stuff, really just stop to think about how much do I really know about textures? You start realizing, wow, it's very humbling. I don't know jack shit about textures. I need to start studying them. And that's why all of these challenges in the community, this massive educational resource for you guys, always have textures in them. Because you're not gonna, you trust me, you're, there's not gonna be a day you wake up and you're gonna be like, I need to study the difference between smoke and clouds. Like there's not, that's not gonna happen unless you have a commission that forces you to do it. Trust me, how do I know? Because I never studied textures until I had a commission that had to have it. And that, that was way too slow because who knows when the next commission is gonna come and how much variety is gonna come out of each one. Yeah, so when you study, uh, someone was like, oh my God, you literally described me when I finished the portrait, I always get burnt out from the painting. Um, and that's just because it's when it's time to do the textures, painting by painting a portrait, it didn't require much thought, did it? You guys are pretty good with portraits. Um, but then it came down to doing the texture and suddenly everything gets super slow and super boring and super, uh, the, the progress goes down to a trickle because essentially you are back to study mode. So your speed, your aptitude, um, and your your general skill level is actually zero at compared to the to the portrait, which is at like 60. Let's say 100 is the cap. Um, you're what like you're 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 two different artists completely, and that's the problem when you guys delay textures. The reason why textures are so important is because they're the matter of the world. So I cleaned up that edge. I'm not sure why you made all those edges super clean. How did I know to do that? Because I understand that the only glowing element really is this little horn. It's not the icicles. The icicles just need to perform as icicles, that's it. So icicles, the way texture of ice works is that it needs its edges. It does not have fuzzy edges. Ice is a hard structure, but it is a translucent structure, meaning that it lets light in, and sometimes it's purely transparent. So I threw in some uh, saturation for the subsurface scattering to consider the translucency. I clean the edge so that it starts feeling like ice again. And then there's a couple of other issues here and there, like the, the fact that it's not really behaving like icicles. Um, icicles have these patterns to them on the outsides that are basically the ice freezing as it starts to trickle down. Icicles are formed because, again, this is the science coming in, ice melted or went slightly above freezing and it started to, the snow started to trickle down, but by the time the night hit, the ice was starting to freeze again. So all of those little pathways of the, of the water stopped melting and they started forming back into icicles. And so I'm just adding a little, it's a little bit too much. I'm just adding a touch here and there just to create that interesting texture outline. 
All right, and then that plus the cast shadow. That cast shadow is really important, so I'm going to spend a bit more time on it. So again, I'm going to grab the bark color. I'm going to go on dark, and I want to keep it saturated. Even the shadows must be saturated on translucent objects. So translucency and subsurface is something that you could learn pretty universally. You don't have to study ice-specific subsurface scattering or or hair specific subsurface scattering. It's all pretty much the same. Subsurface is just an interruption of the core shadow. And you learn all that by studying textures. Again, textures and, and drawing textures and uh, using them in your illustrations is a very different type of art because it is a, a, a reflection of how much you know about the function of that science versus just knowing what to do with your brush. So you, you have to actually learn a little bit of science to do it. It's a very different type of painting. It's very technical because you can't have a stylistic way of doing uh, a snow. You can, it, it still needs to have the basic requirements of what makes snow. You can't decide that snow is actually not white. You know, you can't do that. Um, and still want it to read as snow. It'll just read as some kind of volcanic ash or something. I felt like that that butt shadow could have been a bit wider because you kind of interrupted the shadow in the wrong way there. He's still a thick boy, um, but that 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 little twig going through him is 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 a it would cast a shadow as well. But he still needs his little his little uh, core shadow for his booty. Okay, I like the foreground being blurry, but that needed to be a bit darker as well. Since it's going to be directly in the foreground, it means that it's going to be black as well because it's completely rejected the light. Yes, so what are some of the hardest textures you guys have had to deal with? Snow is the most difficult for me. So sparkly, it has subsurface scattering. Um, so snow is, really the requirement for snow is that in the, the middle ground between sharp shadow and pure white, you have a little, and this, this artist did it very well, you have a little opportunity to apply some detail. And really, uh, it could just be the shimmering itself. If, there, if it is, you know, in the daytime, you could add that shimmer to the white, the pure white, the highest white of the... Uh, of the snow, but I but I'm just gonna copy them. They got sharpen tool, and they just sharpened it. And I'm gonna apply that little border of saturation around each snow shadow, just like that. And then I'm gonna do next thing, which is the most important thing about any reflective surface. This is something you learn when studying cast shadow. Uh, I mean, studying textures is um, the way they receive any highlight. If anything is reflective, it just reflects the purest nature of, of the light, which is its color and its magnitude. Like water, for instance, is like a mirror reflection of the light source. So if you've ever gone kayaking in the daytime, you try to open your eyes fully, you're not gonna, especially if it's in this pure sunlight, it's, it's the, it's, you're just reflecting all of that sunlight back up. Not all of it, uh, of course, but just the, the amount that we get on the surface of the earth. Right, and I'm just applying that yellow there. And then there's this little guy. He can have a shadow, but the shadow will be a, a shadow that the light traveled through in a see-through way. So that means that the cast shadow will be the color of the see-through object. So this is something that you learn if you were to study, let's say, uh, a picture of some see-through cups, party cups that are see-through or colored, colored and see-through, um, and they were like of a particular color. That color would be the cast shadow color as well because the light shot through the object and down on the surface, and that sh cast shadow absorbed the color or reflects the color of the object it shot through. So I'm taking that green and using it on the surface of the cast shadow as well. So a lot of this knowledge that I may have in critique hour about what to do and when something looks wrong, that's all texture knowledge. These are all textures. This is the beauty of textures. <clears throat> so I seem to have lost like the little, the little opening of the horn, the start of the horn. So I'm just going to use 
a little bit just to show where that where that is okay and as for the eye I don't really get it but there's just a couple of cast shadows now and a couple of little um, changes here and there that just round off the the science and I'm just going to I would love for you to have a bit more of a sharper texture for all of these little icicles so I'm just drawing the subsurface outline or rim light in straight lines so straight little lines like that again just to show the path of the of the water as it trickles down so these challenges they're not really a challenge I'm not I'm not really here to critique the, your creativity I'm just here to, to have an excuse to talk about textures and that's the best part about these challenges is that there, there's no wrong answers when it comes to the creativity and that's why I kind of didn't go for the uh, guest uh, speaker today just because it's not a creative discussion, um, uh, which is something I decided last minute compared to the Halloween design challenge, which was a creative discussion, along with staging and cinema and all of that. But this is a mostly texture related because I've seen how difficult you guys, the, 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 the time you guys had with these textures, and I feel like it would be better if it was an instructional class. Okay, so slight changes, but they do a lot for the cast shadows. And um, the moon, I, I'm not sure I like what you did with the moon at all, just because it's so hyper present in the scene. Um, but I'll keep it. Again, it's not about creative critique. It's just about making each individual texture work better. So wherever the spider web goes through, I'm just going to drown it in some of that light. Then I'm going to use sharpen tool to make sure that it sticks out of the background. I feel like there's uh, way too many glowy things here. And that's after I took out the little spider. So that was a very, very glowy armor gold flower petals. So reflective armor, um, I most likely will do another texture assignment in the new year that has a lot of armor in it because we, we need to talk about armor. Um, armor and metallic surfaces, the problem with that texture is that you you're, you need to paint the picture of what the texture is seeing. So you need to, you need to paint the environment around the texture. This means that um, it, if you're going to just paint the surface reflecting what? What is, the, what is the reflective object reflecting? It's reflecting the environment. So the reason why the, the metal surfaces are so difficult is because you guys forget to, um, to, to, to actually paint the picture of the environment that we don't see because we're the camera and it's the environment behind us or the camera itself. Okay, so let's take a picture. Of, I mean, let's take a look at the before and after. So before, after, so the glowing thing, I'm just going to get rid of it since it's not really part of the brief um, to have a second supporting character or something like that. And the cast shadow and the subsurface of the snow made him look a little bit more plump. We definitely do need uh, some subsurface here. He's got them thick thunder thighs. But this is a really lovely idea. Let's just talk about it for a second. Uh, forest winter sprites that are made out of snow that hang lazily off of tree branches, bro. That's amazing. I love that idea. Like, why haven't they used that yet? Where's Pixar? Like, let them hire you or DreamWorks or something. And they kind of like, like, you know, like they fall off the snow and they want to travel. They fall off, you know, they slide off the branch. And when they want to travel fast, they kind of turn into little snowballs. I love this idea. It's so, it's so cute. It's so unbelievably cute. So some subsurface took it um, uh, the rest of the way it needed to go. I'm going to just get it back into saturate here. Try to saturate a little bit more. And sometimes with subsurface scattering, depending on the texture, you could bring in the warm element as well, meaning we grab the light source itself and use it on the painting, on the object, because that's what traveled through the see-through object is the light source plus color. 
So subsurface sometimes is light source plus color. Like look at it before the yellow and after the yellow. Something about after the yellow, look, at, look close enough, is just, it just looks and feels better because you've connected the snow to the surrounding light source that has revealed it. Okay, good job on the bark. Um, but some of these areas, uh, they kind of have too smooth a surface on the side of the bark. So you need to show how you, the, the bark is a very rough texture. If you put your hands on it, you would feel like you have some bumps here, which look great. But here things are a little bit too smooth. If you have two completely different textures in the same illustration, um, you don't want them to have similar edges. Textures are all about edges. Write that back to me. Textures are all about edges. So if the edges don't feel like the texture, then you're going to end up uh, proving that your texture isn't real because you have a texture right beside it that shares the same edge. Alrighty, so I'll, I'll stop it with this one. Let's move forward. Beautiful, beautiful design. I would love to see like a family of them. Like they're so cute and then they're just like snow capybaras. But like I'm not sure, that's the right word, right, capybara? But I'm not sure um, if how you would name them, like capy, capy, capy snow? I don't know, I'm not good at that shit. So it's like a cute little family all rolling around together. I love the little rainbow effect you had and, and the, just the spring morning um, uh, snow is just so cute or winter morning snow with, this, with the sun out. So with this one, it's great, but you have some issues with, with regards to depth, which don't really have a lot to do with environment at the moment. And because I don't want to darken the foreground anymore, I'm just going to brighten the background. And when it comes to texture like snow, what you can do is sweeping brush strokes like this are just fine because snow has this way of uniformly representing the, uh, the light around. Snow is just very, it's not, I wouldn't say it's a temperamental, constantly shifting surface. It's pretty uniform whenever it lightens and darkens. You can use the exact same color pretty much everywhere. So I'm going to leave that, do you see that little bit of sharpness right there? I'm going to leave that just to show, actually it's looking great. And the ice you have here is just wonderful, but I, I wish you added a little bit more of that glisten everywhere else. Because it, th this wing isn't necessarily that much closer to the light source than this wing. They would still get the same amount of sunlight and it's not that turned away and it's a translucent object. So again, you don't have enough excuses to keep that wing so dim. So I'm going to just darken the foreground and separate those two from each other. And then the background, I liked how blue the background was before, but I just want to separate them. And then I'm just going to darken the foreground just a little bit, at least on the edges, just a touch, wherever we have surface like wood. Wood gets dark pretty fast because it has almost no translucency and zero translucency to it. It rejects the light very easily. So as you can see, knowledge is power and knowledge of textures is power because you, you will never feel powerless while you're painting because this is, it's just this beautiful language that you understand in order to fulfill the world that your character lives in with stuff, with, or with the right kind of stuff. So if it's a sunset, this, these are great colors. And if it isn't sunset time, um, I would say like shift things more towards, just, just only look at the snow by the way, shift things towards blue. But you've got such opposing colors everywhere. I'm not sure I understand what's even happening. If it is a sunset, um, we would get really long cast shadows off each hill. So each of these hills would be casting shadows as well. So like over here. That's another thing textures teach you about. 
is cast shadows and how cast shadows have it. You know what? Because you have layer access, I'm going to let you do that. You have nice long cast shadows right here. Again, when you have cast shadows on the same surface, be it a cast shadow coming off a human being or the hill itself, it will be the same color and temperature as the rest of the cast shadows on the snow. There's no reason why the cast shadow coming off a human being needs to be different. I'm just going to borrow some surrounding environment highlights just to get those cast shadows to read a little bit better. And then I'm just going to use dodge tool on highlight and try to get all this ice to speak the same language. I might cast the shadow of the branch on the ice. So I'll go to the previous layer and just cut this light right, right in that area. And then each of these little fingers is getting light because the light breached. The side is a twig. So that's it. Once you get the basic requirements for the texture, it'll actually just start making sense. It'll look, it'll read very quickly. An artist who's good at texture, their textures will read very quickly. Um, because they understand what makes or breaks the texture because they've studied it. So ice means that it's going to be bright, it's going to be re reflecting the surrounding landscape, and it's going to have subsurface scattering, and it's going to be uh, reflecting a lot of white um, off the light source. So Bark needs to have surface texture, it needs to be dark. In order to make sense, I'm just going to cut the shadow. Oops, not at a tangent. Like maybe right there. That's a good spot. That's the cast shadow of the of this branch right here, just moving upward. And it needs to have that almost sinewy, thunder-like texture movement to it. So remember, a texture is in its edge. It's in its outline. So that means that the outline and the nature, the movement of the object is also part of it because how did it form? Ice forms with gravity and so it has a very long, um, uh, 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 sharp, edgy kind of geometric almost silhouette to it. So textures are about their silhouettes as well. Write that down. I'm just going to push these little guys a little further. And I'm um, just going to get saturate and just push this little glow. And the little glow it throws off is actually going to land on the surrounding snow because that's still snow on the surface of the branch. And I believe I did not load Dasha's in, so I'm not sure. Dasha, did you want me to look at yours? Since I've already looked at yours. Um, did you want to send it to me real quick through um, Discord? And then I'm just going to keep taking a little bit at a time, erasing. And I'm just going to let that snow. Snow is like a mirror, but a very foggy mirror, all right? So write that down. So you have to remember this kind of quick little way to describe the texture. Because, you know, believe it or not, it sounds silly, but it will change the way you remember the texture. And the way you remember the texture is the way you draw the texture. Um, and that always changes everything. So this far side here is facing the light source completely. So I'm not 100% sure why your snow is so dim. I'm not even sure, was this me? I'll check your before, but you really need to push that brightness up a little bit for that far side. Because we need to explain where all this light is coming from. And if it's a sunset during, a, during the winter and it's snowy, then there's no reason why that light is, is incapable of piercing through the snow. So actually not, I'm not sure I want to 
darken. Yeah, see, when snow has subsurface, it just looks good. Look at that. Look at when I erase, it just looks like mud all of a sudden. But when I didn't erase and let Dodge Tool lighten that shadow up, even in just that area, it just looks right. Once you learn those quick little quirks that come with textures, you just you just paint differently because and these all of these little features of textures and textures are so amazing because there's so many types of materials in the world. You um you you once you learn them you can't really you know forget them. You, you just end up uh, uh, having this constantly equipped in your mind. So next time you think about any kind of raising the vial, the, the the magnitude of light source, you know that it may come with translucency and it may come with subsurface. All right. As for color, um, again, I'm not sure why everything looks purple. I have uh, just a problem with that. It might have been a combination of your values and undertones plus mine. I want to uh, make this look a little bit more. I'm going to keep this the, the pink in between, this little line of pink. See that? I'm going to keep that there, but I do want to encourage the nighttime values to start coming in, which are those blues. They really pop out in the snow. And that blue uh, contrasting the yellowy golden value of the sunset on the surface of the snow is the best part about it. So I'm just gonna do that and then I'm gonna get sponge tool on saturate and just push that, set my saturates on 100, push that little bit a little bit further. And then I'm gonna get uh, this white value here and I'm just gonna let some of it just sit on the surface just so things brighten up a little bit more. Again, this hill needs a, needs a shadow. I'm not sure what's happening here, but it needs to be dark because that's the edge of the canvas. There's no need and no reason to have that area illuminate. And this little area's got kind of a bleed to it Make sure it's hard. It, the, it's not see-through. Trees are not see-through. That'd be really cool. The trees are not see-through. And then you've got this twig here. Again, I'm not trying to talk design too much, but this is creating like a tangent. This twig is almost perfectly parallel with the cast shadows cast by these little guys here. And the cast shadows are part of the fun. You know, we need these cast shadows so we know what we're looking at. And they're actually really, they're adding a really dynamic, fun, extra thing to look at without actually over uh, crowding the illustration. Cast shadows are like beautiful ways to decorate your illustration and, and still get away with um, uh, kind of, it's not crowding, but it is like crowding because you added two extra elements and then you have these two elements, but you get away with it because they're cast shadows. You're supposed to have them. <coughs> And I would adjust this cast shadow of the dog to be a little bit more thin and dispersed and then the human to take the shape of the human, maybe to even have a space for where the legs are spread. All right, and then I'm going to just grab dodge tool again and then just let the sun drown this area because we wanna create a, diff a distance between the foreground and the background, but I also don't want to oversaturate or over over um, load this uh, this scene with too many new colors. So I'm just gonna wash it back in blue, just like the artist originally intended. And again, I'm just gonna select. It's not so much an atmospheric perspective; it's just what snow does. Snow blooms. Snow glows outward. So remember, all of the changes I made today, nearly all of them are texture related. This is how domin like dominating texture is in your, in your illustrations. If you don't study them, you really are uh, signing up for a handicap for no reason the next time you paint. So study them, it's easy. And I give all of my students st uh, texture packages of similar textures to similar textures, depending on what they want to study. 
because there's no reason as important as it is to learn symmetry in a portrait that's how important it is to stay versed in the variety of textures that you'll be expected to do there's so many the world is made out of all kinds of stuff and if you want to have the power to create and paint everything you're gonna to have to study textures specifically so it's not just like an, a, a passive thing that I have enforced texture for so long in these environment in these studies in these challenges it, it's because I know it's a real problem because I was exactly where you were having a lot of issues coming to terms with the fact that not everything is a face and no, just because you learned a face doesn't mean you learned everything. And I, back then I used to have pride. I used to be like, oh, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to have to use a reference every time I, you know, I, I need to know something. Um, but obviously I got over that fast. But still, it's, it's, um, it's good to understand, to memorize the science of a texture. Um, and uh, not necessarily memorize every texture. And then I'm going to select inverse and bring the dodge tool and just try to push some of that light on it. So it felt a little bit matte for something that was supposed to be ice and glowing. And you did a really great job showing where um, the, the colors of the background on the ice, which is a big component of painting good ice, is the color of the background has got to be visible. Um, but so you did great with that, but the magnitude of the light needs to be a little bit stronger. You need to really reflect that, that, uh, the light presence and the light color as much as, um, equally respectively. Okay. So let's take a look at the before. So everything feels kind of dark. Um, it could be because it's a later time in the day, but it is snow. So it seems like a very dim light is on somewhere down the street and I feel like that is not enough reason for this object to have um, uh, so much light on that one wing. So it feels like we can still keep it as a sunset time but still have an excuse for making these wings a little bit brighter. So I fix the depth and then of course all the subsurface scattering needed on that snow as well as the saturation line. So I would, if I had a better lasso. I would go in now and just saturate them. What the hell am I doing? All right, so I would saturate that snow a little bit. Not oversaturated because it isn't about the snow, but let me let me use sponge tool instead. Oops. Select inverse. See, it's not, it's very dangerous to oversaturate anything in the background because saturation is another form of detailing. Do you guys remember the ways to detail edge work, contrast, and small brush work? Well, uh, saturation, once you move into color, is the fourth and final way. And so oversaturating something is great when you're doing it on a focal point because you just get away with it, even, even that. Um, but, uh, but on anything in the background is just disruptive. Um, so it, like I did a fraction of what I did on this thing in the background, it was too much. All right. But, uh, as for, you know, how it followed the rules of the, of the prompt, I think you did wonderfully. Um, it's not too familiar an animal, but it, it can take the shape of it, but it looks mostly like ice, like long and, and sinewy like ice does. Great work. Let's keep talking about it. All right, so for this guy, um, one of the challenges we had last year, do you guys remember that elephant? Was it an elephant? Was it a mammoth? Um, I think it was. And it was just like this super beautiful mammoth thing. Um, uh, so it was also made out of ice. And one of the issues that we had was that there was you no know, representing scale, the icy mammoth, yeah. Um, and uh, and just balancing the, the sub. So this reminds me of that a little bit. This is nighttime. So, so what I'm going to do is focus mostly on what this creature really is doing, which is it glows when it hits the ground. I'm over providing the glow. I will delete. So I, I delete paint. You guys have noticed me do that a lot. I, I, I do that a lot, um, which is I overdo 
the layer and then I come back in a new layer by copy pasting, going back in the history and just deleting it what I don't want. I guess it's, it's easier to delete it what you don't want because you, you know, it's right in front of you, you see it as you delete it. You could do it in the other way as well. There's no, there's no wrong answers as long as the end result looks believable. So the problem, I have to talk design here because it's just too dark. It's hard to see anything. So I'm just going to over, overdo some of this stuff just so we can get a general idea of what we're looking at. And even this looks right. Um, but, but let's just stay close to what you designed. So lighter at the bottom. So before, do you see what I'm saying? That was pitch black after. So what I'm going to do is a general darkening of the top. All right, so I'm going to leave it there. But I will go back and, and do some more stuff later. But for now, what I'm going to do is just forgetting about the bloom of the, like the, the glow of the object's light, the emanation, the that just that, that the dispersion of light around him, either on objects nearby or or in or the subsurface in him from his own light source at the bottom there, his feet. And I'm just gonna focus only on the edge of his texture and whatever light is trapped within his eyes just because of the feet. So any of that volumetric light coming from the bottom. All right, so see that? So we're just getting his legs, all right? So we can keep it dark if you want to. And then we'll bring in the bloom. Um, I'm actually going to just use eraser to see if I can do more. And then I'm gonna leave this, I'm gonna try to preserve this uh, lasso so it could help me with the rest. So ice at night should be mostly black. You, you, did, you did right by that, that you needed to keep it black. But it is a problem when we can't even see the creature you designed. So if this was a game and you had to kill this thing and you had to find it, like this cowboy here is looking for it, you know, have, we'd have a very hard time. So if you are going into game design, this is a bad design the way you had it before. It's just not feeling right. So again, I'm showing where all that light is trapped as it moves up. So he has two, he has two different types of magic. He's got his glowing feet which have this very turquoisey light, which I love on anything. Um, and he's got this, this, this kind of like a uh, warmer, warmer because it's like a less, like a, it's not as much combustion, I guess, or not as much magic happening up there. So it's kind of like a cooler blue, cooler, yeah. Um, and then I'm just gonna go backward. And I'm gonna try to capture the rest of him. I'm gonna do something pretty controversial. Are you guys ready? I'm gonna make him kind of glow in this really quiet glow because what it's gonna do is it's gonna make his character feel actually, it's like reverse is right. It's gonna make his character feel a little bit more magical. I'm going to try to pull it off, but it's like a super um, uh, soft brush stroke. It's nothing too extreme. It's just a little here and there, just so that he, he can still be off into the distance where he needs to be, but some of that light travels quite a bit. Have you ever driven away from your town and you're on your way home? And there's a glowing in the distance in the direction of your town, but you're like, I am very sure my town is not that bright. Have you guys ever had that experience? That's the exact same thing we're dealing with here. Even if it's a little lamp, you can see it from a distance. You can definitely catch it, and uh, especially at night. Yeah, you, yes, there's my light pollution. Um, but that's how light works, is that it just... It's got a very strong presence to it, especially when it's nighttime, pitch black, no other lights nearby. You can see a mountain from my, I mean, a, a town from miles away just because of that. 
<clears throat> so now that I added all that extra brightness everywhere, I'm just going to actually get rid of those two eyes because they're kind of dorky and they're not even looking in the right direction. If he was this colossal creature taking gigantic mammoth steps across the land, his eyes would be more focused forward than, you know, they'd be like um, looking forward like that. Do you see? So we're seeing his underbelly. Then, uh, then looking down at the camera conveniently. So I'm just trying to make it look like a gentle creature. If you wanted to, to make it look a little bit more insane and out of control and feral, then you could add those big, uh, sharper eyes. So I'm not even sure what's happening in this. I'm not sure why you only highlighted this arm. I'm trying to just stay true to your design as well here. And then back to dodge tool. Just showing how some components glow a little bit more than others. You know, I've been watching a lot of Star Wars recently, and I'm just, it's, it, they haven't really explored creature design as much as they should for Star Wars. Do you know what I'm saying? Creature design could really have been pushed so far with that show, especially in Mandalorian. Um, they, they, they had one earthly bison, um, uh, rhino type character, and then they had another sand character the uh, creature, sorry, that burrows in the sand like a Mulduga or whatever. And then they had a couple more sand creatures that run on the surface of the sand. And that's about it. Like, can we get some ice creatures or, you know, that was really cool with the foxes. Can you elaborate? Can we get like magical freaking creatures? You know, creatures like basically this um, that travel across the planet. Um, we only seem to really be dealing with uh, a couple of sand beasts of burden and like that's it and one really crazy creature or like one really cool design that everybody's always referencing which is the ice fox and that's it um i hope so yeah uh, kyle says they'll probably explore more creature designs in the game but that's but the game is different it's a different type of entertainment i feel like in a movie they could really take a lot um uh, uh spend a lot more time on the detail all right, so these things are glowing. Underbelly is getting a lot of that light because movies have higher budgets and they get to have a little bit more fun with how the char characters interact with them and all that. Or shows, at least. Shows are really cool, but shows have lower budgets. So. Okay, and so what you could have done here is some explanation as to what he does once he does touch the surface of the ground. Um, maybe there's some kind of really cool uh, uh, design that, you know, that some kind of floral element that comes out. One thing I've been doing is just getting an Aurora Borealis because we're looking up at the sky. Um, we might see a couple, so I just, I just get whatever textures I can find and overlay them. Um, open image new tab and I just use whatever layers I could mess with layer modes but I feel like you could benefit from that since we are looking up at the at the creature so what I'm gonna do to mess with layers properly is you need a nice clear black or white backdrop um, so you could take the levels and bring them down all the way so that when you use screen you could see the majority of the of the work basically we're minimizing the amount of gray area in order for that texture to come through sorry i can't see the chat right now all right and then i'm just going to throw it on screen uh i had the idea of aurora borealis but i thought it wasn't looking great you just have to spend some time um messing with different opacity levels and different patterns for the for the for the Aurora Borealis. You don't have to have it be super crazy. It's just because we're seeing the sky that we would like to at least see some more of the um, 
of, of something interesting happening in the sky. But you, you don't have to. But he's so colossal. He feels like the forest spirit from, from uh, Mononoke. That um, it feels like he brings these, these phenomenon with him. He seems to be, he reminds me very much of the spirit, the forest spirit, especially in his blue form, um, which might be a nice way for us to add some light so that, let me just go back to screen, so that we could bring the silhouette of the monster through. So if you do bring the Aurora Borealis in, what you have to do is basically cut out the, the creature so that he's darker than the background. I'm gonna just quickly lasso this in a matter of seconds. She lassos. Call me Wonder Woman. Beautiful form. I'm gonna win the Lasso Olympics. Do you guys think they'll ever host Lasso Olympics? There should be Olympics just for Lasso Tool on Photoshop. Um, so select inverse, and I'm just going, oopsie, that's not what I meant to do. But because he's kind of see-through, so that kind of does help. Hmm, but anyway, I deleted behind him. Okay, um, I don't know what I'm doing. I forgot. All right, so yeah, I was gonna delete, and then I go, okay, now I know what to, I'm doing. And then I'm gonna get multiply, and just use it on the back of him. Ooh. Do you guys see what just happened? We can still see him, but now the Aurora Borealis is behind him, so we have a, a bit of a silhouette. And I'm still gonna use dodge tool. I still want that combination of dodge tool and Uh, silhouette happening which is going to be a nice little balance for you to mess around with and then trying to bring back some of the glow glows which is like his eyes I might bring that down a little bit more and, and I do like the idea of some of the Aurora Borealis kind of uh, revealing uh, he's kind of see-through so if you'd like um, I'm just gonna preserve the lasso. If you'd like, you could just, on a new layer, on, I guess normal is fine, just grab some of the green and just show how it might go through him, just a little bit. But we still wanna show that he's darker. He's not opaque and he's not see-through and maybe his legs and area, this area is a little bit see-through. Just to show a little bit of see-throughness. For the area directly behind him, the horizon line, you could do something cray cray, like insane, which is at a partial sunrise. Um, that's gonna throw a whole other, you know, another ball of yarn. <laughs> that's even a saying. A whole other ball of yarn to deal with. Um, but let's try it. Let's see what happens. So it's just like a partial sunset. So I lost the last one again, what, how? Select inverse, okay. And new layer, right? Yeah, let's just make sure we're not. And we're just showing the sunrise coming in. And that's just gonna make things insane. But we, you don't have to do it, obviously, because we have the Aurora Borealis uh, happening here. Um, but it's really interesting to see how much we could mess with the different uh, conditions the ice can deal with and maybe it's just a little bit purple right before it turns and you could just make it another I maybe mean, nearby city or something but it'd be, it'd be really cool if you stuck true to the sunrise and it kind of starts off in this kind of tone kind of almost pinkish yes yes and then um select inverse and i'm just grabbing some of that pink and I'm gonna use it on his legs, just to show where the sunrise will be shooting through. Ooh, that's bright. And then a little bit, maybe, 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 
just a little bit of that light breached right at the top of his of his helmet. Maybe there's like a huge oh, amount of light just coming through. I believe they do see the aurora borealis at dawn, right? I believe they can see it in the day in the end, like right before sunrise. It's right at the top. And I'm going to borrow some of that pink. I can be wrong about all of this stuff. But as long as I understand the limitations of the texture, I could experiment as much as I want to. I don't like this, but uh, but I just want to see how much I could get away with before I, before I backtrack. I like the look. I like what's happening to it. Maybe, maybe none at the top. Maybe only at the bottom. So now these, because these horns are starting to look like more like light, but I, I liked where it was going. If the light was coming from the side of the mountain, that'd be really cool because then we would just do something like this and that's the light coming off the side of the mountain. But but I just want to show how the very tips of his, of his hat right up there could get a little bit of that light shooting through. This is if you wanted the sunrise effect. If you don't want it, you can get rid of it. Um, but it's just about adding more stuff in the background compared to where we were before where it was just pitch black. All right, so we're balancing subsurface, we're balancing glow, um, and we're just adding more elements while keeping it interesting. I, you know me, I love when things are like kind of too dark to see anything. You know me, I'm always darkening scenes. But it was just a bit too dark before. It was hard to see absolutely anything. Um, like if you had just had something like at this level, that would have been enough too. Um, so let me see. If you had like things at this level, like they were pretty dark. Even the Aurora Borealis can stay dark. But definitely, definitely anywhere he touched the ground would be super bright and a little bit of the aurora would be super bright like if you wanted it to be as dark if you felt like in your heart you I really want this to be dark something is telling me to make it as dark as possible you could you could just push it this is pretty much as dark as possible before it just gets ridiculously dark which is the way you did it before <coughs> Okay, and this is like where we were after, and then uh, I would just let a little bit of the Aurora Borealis come through, just a little bit more, just like a little curve of it to come through. Okay, I know, we're like only on the third one. Um, okay, so this guy is super cute, first of all, I would like to pick him up and kiss him. Second, I'm not sure what's happening. The light is coming out of him and shining on the ground beneath him. Let me show you where that was a problem. The way you created the edge of this cast shadow, which is his cast shadow, I believe, because he's the light source, does not make sense because it is almost the exact same, uh, uh, what do we call it, a textural footprint as this edge, which is supposed to be dirt and snow. Do you see what I'm saying? Is the artist here today? So why is this a problem? Because they look so similar. I'm not gonna assume as the viewer that this is a cast shadow, but let me show you the fix. Let me show you why they, why they call me is the black. Let me show you. All right. Filter, blur, Gaussian blur. All of a sudden, like it was magic, it's a cast shadow again does not stop there. When a light surface, when a bright surface receives a cast shadow, that cast shadow can actually stay pretty bright. So let's brighten this son of a bitch. Alrighty. And then it's still a problem because this cast shadow is coming out of a blue object down into the ground in a bright environment. So the environment is, we can't tell where the cast shadow is really coming from right now because you haven't really darkened everything else. This object isn't the only light source of the area. So let's make it the only light source of the area. So what color is coming out of him that can shine on pretty much everything else? So this purpley color that's being shot through, we're going to cool it down a little bit towards purple because of the blue. 
and we're just gonna throw that color on everything because now he's look he looks like he's the only light source in the area I'm gonna throw a little bit of that blue as well since it's going through and that blue that went through the crystals is actually turning the crystals once they reach the ground a little bit purple and because it's not ideal none of this is ideal meaning that the cast shadow coming off such a direct light source like this should have had the shape of the crystals coming out as well so he would have had this like really long cast shadow wherever the light breached through each crystal do you see that so cast shadows take the shape of the objects that are casting that they are cast through or cast upon so we're just going to throw some long lines here just to show that off so you see most of my knowledge is just texture knowledge that's what i'm mostly always doing in critique hour um and then sometimes because the light is pretty close to the to the ground it gets a little bit brighter and then as for his little um, lights here, what I would do is not make them cross. I would just add a space in between them. And then that little space I will blur in a moment. I should have just made it in a new layer. It's just straight lines. And then I'm going to just get a bigger brush and just keep pressing harder out towards the edge because cast shadows are sharper when they start. Cast shadows are actually texture behavior because you can't really call it just specific light on form because light on form is about the edges and the, the flesh of the, of the matter, the volume. Whereas cast shadows behave a lot closer and like the cousins of texture. And then because he's a light source, I would really boost up anywhere we have light. So this essentially, the light of his headlights is the same light, the same blue as his uh, back. So I would just add a bit of that. So it's a pretty complex little thing you throw for yourself here, but it's okay. And then the bottom here, wherever we have the relief should be purple because that's the light source being cast off this object and every cast shadow should just pretty much be the same it should be purple and then where you have all of these little rock formations in the foreground they should all be overlapping and completely dark but they do have a blurry edge so i don't use all that many types of tools only a couple and they all pretty much have the same reason, which is just that they are, soft brush is great for representing the light source's texture, cast shadows and soft brush are, are a thing, soft brush has a blurry edge, soft brush and, and blur are pretty much the same thing, Gaussian blur, see what I'm saying? So there's not much, you know, um, variety of the, of, the, of the brushes that I'm using at all. So this light is shooting directly into this little cave here. So I'm going to try to use it as an excuse to have some more geometric form to the space around using my blocking brush. Actually, didn't I erase all of it? Just showing how some of that light gets into the alley there. Just to show different little levels of earth and what they're doing. And this little canyon that he lives in where he's just going around lighting things up like a little disco ball Pokemon, which is also super cute. You guys have some really cute creature designs, which is why 
it's not wasted. Skill is not wasted on you guys. You guys are gonna. You guys are the future artists of of the industry. What do you think? Like, there's gonna be the same fucking ten guys making movies in, in Hollywood. You guys are the future. So, the ideas you guys have are unbelievable. They're just they're so good. Like the snow, the snow creature. I've never seen that ever before. And I'm just gonna cast a shadow this way. Put a little canyon there. Race with soft brush there. I'm making a little bit more sense of it because this is a very complicated form study. And um, and what we need to do now is just let some of that blue. So blue mixed with red is purple. So I'm just going to really up the saturation on that purple and um, just let some of that purple sit in the glass of the rocks because that's the blue piercing through. And some of that same blue hits the ground. Same rules. The rules of physics are beautiful because they apply the same everywhere. If it's on Venus versus the Earth, it's all the same. The rules of physics do not change. Just the, the nature of an electron, the nature of an atom. So you can trust your fundamentals to serve you um, no matter what you end up using them for. And then back here, either this area is darker or brighter. Uh, I'll try with both. Um, darker doesn't look right, but feels right. But I know that bright would look right and feel right. Just because it looks bright, just because it's a yeah, it does feel right with the with the bright interior because all that light is shooting out. But I'm gonna keep it with with what's half in, half out, meaning that it's gonna be bright at the ends, uh, dark at the ends, and bright at the start. And then there's the general glow, which I feel like you could push, but also this glow might just shoot out just like that, like a like a big beacon. Um, it just depends on, you know, what what this is all about at the end. But I'm just gonna add that. Okie dokie. Um, so lots of stuff for this little boy. Merge down. Really cute elemental, just like a little rock beast of burden farming elemental. So before, after. So you had that universal light source, which was kind of throwing off. Again, I'm so confused about the shadow. Is it his shadow? Like it's it's confusing. But it was it was throwing everything off. And now actually that we've decided he's the light source, we could really amp up the brightness in the area. Um, ignore the white in the middle just for the, the, the outskirts. So we want that to stay like that. Just so we can brighten the environment a little bit more. Love the disco effect. The booty lights? The booty lights? Did I really forget something? I wanted to make it look like he's melting the, st the snow, but I obviously failed. Okay, so that makes sense. Um, so snow would only melt around his feet, and you didn't fail. No, you didn't fail, but it, I think you just need to show... The reason why it's confusing is because the ground is the same color as him. So... But you also have these headlights, which are visible, which would only really be visible in the dark. So what I think you should have done is, if if they, if it is, he is right now melting the snow. Do you know what I'm saying? We just don't see it. We shouldn't be able to. You shouldn't waste too much time on it. If he's so hot that he's like red hot, like a red ball of metal rolling down the side of a snowy hill, then he would himself, like, he would be glowing with that heat. You know what I'm saying? Like, have you ever seen a blacksmith make a sword and that, that, that the smelting or whatever they do? I don't even know what smelting is. Like, why do they call it smelting? What kind of just call it melting? But anyway, um, he would just be, like, glowing red hot like that. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, 
it's not pure red it's not pure white it's like pink in the middle and then there's a little bit on the outsides and it's just a red hot ball rolling through the hill I don't feel like he's that much you know I feel like it could be heat there could be heat coming off of him and I'm not sure if you drew steam where he was melting all of that snow so it's not just gonna melt it's basically tss, like it's just receding so um so you had a lot of concepts here you were messing around with that weren't gonna be easy uh let's move forward so these guys are, are not doing what an elemental should be doing which is supporting their own joking um, I'm not sure what the story is here. They're bad guys who kill people, or are they helping him? Um, so this was a creature design, so we, we don't really... We, I didn't want any of this, just because I wanted it to be focused on um, the textures. But right now, you use all your rendering power, and now the elementals on the portrait, now the elementals feel like secondary characters. So I really wanted you to push it. Um, for the for the uh, for the for the elementals, so let's darken the scene a little bit, and I'm gonna duplicate the layer and turn it into color. Disable that for a moment. Now what I'm gonna do is just, oops, I'm gonna delete away at where we have light coming off their little beams. So this is just about light environment and light behavior. And I'm gonna turn on the color. And then color and just get their beams to look right. And a consistent color throughout. So if it is nighttime and then just to make it a little bit less about the human being, I would uh, try to darken. Oh my gosh, this lasso is abysmal. I've definitely gotten the bronze and lasso. I'm, I'm, I got disqualified in the lasso Olympic. Damn, I went in so cocky and I came home with nothing. So that's just how it goes. Got a shame to Canada. And then I'm just uh, trying to show that the background, This I'm trying to add mystery to the human beings. Then it's now about, not the human being, but about the creatures. So select inverse, and I'm just darkening the human, um, burn my mid-tone. Yeah, so I'm darkening the human quite a bit so that we can barely see their face. So it's just about these little guys and what they're doing to the human. But we can we can still see some of the human, so we we could you know tell what's going on, and then I'm going to brighten the background behind them just a little. So again, that's just a silhouette of the human being behind, and then it's them kind of peeking through, doing their little magics, being suspicious, and then this light. <clears throat> Is this the Statue of Liberty? No, no, the Statue of Liberty wouldn't look like it's dead. Never mind. Um, and then this light here. I'm almost done. Oh, wow, it's 630. I'm having a lot of fun talking about texture. This light here would be the same color all the way through. Wherever they shine their little light. And, um, hmm. Maybe I'll use lighten. Actually, lighten's too strong. Maybe I'll use soft light. And they're just shining on the human's eye. Just like that. So we're building an environment that's about the creature design. So creature design, where is it used in media? It's used in those moments when the creature takes over the person or eats them alive. It's used in uh, the moment where you, only the creature is in the scene. Wherever the only creature is in the scene, that's when you need creature design de dedicated to that. Because if it's not 
that important a creature. Really, they don't really spend a lot of time. They just they just do something quick. But they spend time when it's about um, no, that's wrong. Uh, uh, close-ups of any kind or some kind of animal or creature they're trying to avoid that might bring some kind of death with it or a creature that saved someone's life that has some kind of plot importance so that's why i wouldn't want you to confuse creature design with illustration design um because it's it, or illustrations period because right now you now we're thinking about what these creatures are and what they're doing. The, uh, the This artist posted their thumbnails on the community and they looked really, really great. And if this is a human being and not the Statue of Liberty, then we would have a bit more subsurface on the hair. Just catching the light like that and then a little bit of a cast shadow off the environment there. You're welcome, you're welcome. Yes, it does definitely add mystery. We lost this little guy, but what you could do is add a little bit of that snowy fog just so he comes out. So select inverse, and we're just grabbing some of this mysterious fog they seem to bring with them and uh, just let him come out of the out of the shadow a little bit and then in the foreground i would add just a more more of the shadow more of the darkness uh actually no you could leave the fog too actually what the hell am i saying you could leave some of that fog here um some of this snowy surface bounce light can still happen in cast shadows write that back to me so you could still show, especially if it's snow, because there's ambient light that still travels around from other areas that it bounced from, from the source, but it kept bouncing and bounced even into core shadow areas and bounced back up or found a small little pocket um, of light. So it can still happen in cast shadows or from areas near a cast shadow, or the cast shadow wasn't strong enough to reject total light source. Um, either way, um, you, you can benefit from a little bit of, if you want it to be completely drowned and in, in the shadow, just have 100% black ambient occlusion, you could do that, but if you wanted to mess with it a little bit. And if these guys had any kind of translucency, I believe they're made out of rock, but if they had any kind of translucency, this would be a great place to show it, but they don't. So this is like a an example. It would be swatched like that. Not that purple, but wherever you have a shadow. So before it's kind of about the dead person and his little buddies are like oh no master come back to life or yay we killed him let's eat his eyeballs um uh but now we kind of just pay a little oh, whoops we pay a little less attention to him and more attention to them as for the color i just picked any color i wanted you could you could change it to the eerie spooky swamp green Ooh, i love that one um, or you could change it to uh, the wintery scene, which was what it was supposed to be about. Kind of like winter elementals, um, icy rock, black ice, all of that stuff. Um, so you could have messed with that as well. All right. And these challenges, what they're great for is they're great for making you illustrate in ways you haven't really done before. Making you think about stuff you have never uh, thought about um, maybe even painting an illustration for the very first time. These challenges are amazing for that. So yes, this is a, I'm not 100% sure what they're made of, like twigs, branches. Um, if it was branches, it should look a little different than that. It seems like it's all skeletal. Um, the, the glowing element is right. Um, but again, I'm not 100% sure how it relates to the winter time. Um, if it was black ice as well, it's not looking like ice. If it was twigs and branches, there's no, there's too smooth for, to be uh, twigs and branches. Um, but all in all, I think as an illustration, it looks good. You can feel the moonlight hitting the ground. I love the cast shadow. Um, I love the light on the ground though. I wouldn't let it be that yellow. I think it would just, it needs to be desaturated just a little bit into like a, a gray or something like that. What is that? What am I doing? So I would just wanna 
what is this? Is this is this gray? This is almost gray. Look at that. Just a little bit of gray makes makes the makes it look yellow. Um, but yeah, I'd make it. Oh, I'll just add blue. I'll just make it more slight, just because that moonlight is so strong, but it's pretty dominant. We wouldn't have tiny little lights like this reflecting back up against the, the what the moon is doing to the snow. So I wouldn't waste too much time trying to show where that reflection is. If you were going to darken the scene a lot, then you can keep those old reflections where they were on the ground, just because they're dominant. Um, yeah, there we go. Just because that now they are the dominant light source. So we're deleting wherever we have these guys come in. Do you understand now? So we can keep these areas bright. But because that moon is so, so bright, there's no reason really, and it kind of feels really weird to add to add yellow to the snow. It almost looks like the yellow, the snow itself is yellow and not, it has nothing to do with the glow of the, of the, um, of the element there, of the skulls and the, and the heart. As for these, these things, um, I like when magic is the same color because it relates to how the magic works. It explains the magic's uh, mechanics. Um, but uh, but when it comes to like what's powering him and then these seem to be his victims, uh, I would change the color of his victims. But then, you know, it, it's it's I've seen the same thing happen where all the victims are ghostly and green and the, like thresh design basically. Um, but if you did want it to be more twig-like, you could just turn, you could really salvage this for the sake of the challenge. I love the trees in the background, by the way. Wow. Um, but you could, uh, you could, you could make him a little bit more twig-like. You could really just try to find some examples, some references, and make everything a twig, out of twigs, even the antlers. Um, it just seems like you lost the texture and it's no longer a texture study. Um, it's just a, some kind of a creature design outside of any textures that you might benefit from in the illustration. But beautiful job all in all. So thank you everyone for submitting stuff. This has been the last critique hour of the year. So I will not see you guys until the week of the 3rd or the week of the 10th. Long break, very long break, but I really need one because I have been teaching nonstop. I think I deleted 300 or 400, I forget. Um, illustrations off my desktop just from homework from the last time I cleaned my, my my desktop which was like in September or October I cleaned my desktop so I think I've critiqued like 300 400 pieces I really forget it was my full desktop was full my my desktop is that smallest um like my my, my images my 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 this is me just enlarging them but um view uh, small icons. I'm at the smallest icons and the whole thing was full. So how many, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, and it was packed from corner to corner from just the last time I critiqued and it was all student homework. So I've been critiquing like crazy because every, every, every student gets like six pieces of homework and every two weeks, and I've been doing that for a year, and I barely take any breaks. And if it's breaks, so I was doing projects outside. It's been a very long and tiring year, and I hope I hope I can actually rest and not know, you know, and not start working on something else in this break and actually rest my brain um, a little bit. But thank you everyone for coming. You guys are amazing. Thank you for participating. Look out for the next assignment for the next community challenge. And I love you guys so much. Happy New Year. Happy Holidays. I hope all of your resolutions and all of your goals are met by this time next year. And, um, and, and stay true to know why you started drawing. Keep drawing. Never give up on it because you picked it for a reason. Something called you to this field for a reason. You're sitting in this stream for a reason. I wish you guys all the luck and happiness and Happy New Year to everybody. I'll see you guys in the New Year. Bye.